just form a fucking wall. O'Neal deep in the post, lots of contact there. Oh, what a block by Wallace! What wow. a jump ball! Fifteen down, four, 12-8, 7-38 to play the first one. Oh, yeah. First from Rossi, stuck into the rim! Count them, baby, and a foul! Reggie in, Bobby Portis in, Reggie inside for Andre, oh. and a dynamite dunk! Pistons fans, welcome back to another edition of the Palace of Pistons podcast, part of the Believe uh, podcast network. I'm your host, Mike Angolano, and with me, as always, is Aaron Johnson. Aaron, how are you doing, buddy? Doing good, Mike. Lots to talk about with the Pistons. Some, uh, you know, fun stuff to get into. A lot of discussion surrounding the young guys today. So excited to get into it here with you. Yes, lots to talk about with the young guys. Saban Lee, right? Everyone wants to talk about Saban Lee for Pistons Twitter. Wow, yes. you read my Maybe, maybe another Mitch McGarry uh, pod, <laughs> hey, perhaps. Maybe I got a couple messages saying just do 60 minutes on Mitch McGarry. Maybe I did, and I'll let the listeners kind of decide on that one. <laughs> that is letting it percolate right there, my friend. Okay, um, so Palace Pistons podcast, yes, lots of talk about the young guys. Killian Hayes has come back. Um, that is basically the most exciting thing to happen to the Pistons in weeks. Um, maybe months at this point. Uh, but first, uh, I want to talk about our sponsors real briefly. Bet Online, the Masters is here. Bet Online has you covered for all the news, scores, and odds. It is the best way to place your bets, and it's free to sign up. It's the fastest and easiest way to bet on all of your sports action. Head to the website betonline.ag or use your mobile device to sign up today. And you can receive your 50% welcome bonus on your first deposit. Again, that's betonline.ag. And you can use your mobile device to sign up today and receive your 50% welcome bonus on your first deposit. BetOnline, your online sportsbook experts. Yes, the Masters is here. I am excited. It is Masters week. I mean, this is like Jim Nance week, right? He's got the Final four, and then the Masters just rolled right into it. This is this is Jim Nance's week. He pulls out a cryo space after, uh, you know, the um, the Masters ends, and the, and it's it is it is his time. I am very very excited for the Masters. Uh, you know, I'm a big golf guy. Love to get out, swing the clubs. Uh, it's probably a lot prettier for everyone else involved to watch the professionals do it rather than watch me do it. <laughs> well, I'm, that's what I'm going to do this weekend. I'm going to put the clubs down and I'm going to watch the professionals do it. Very, very excited. Um, definitely, definitely excited to watch it. Probably place a little, place a little money on it and uh, sure. play a very, very fun weekend of golf. I mean, you cannot go wrong there. This is uh, the best time for sports. And I say, I said this last year before the world ended and shut down, but it is the best time. If you're a baseball fan uh, between baseball and March madness and the masters, you know, this is, this is the time and the NBA playoffs, you know, start to take shape and, and whatnot. It is a good time if you're a sports fan. So definitely go over to betonline.ag um, or use your mobile device to sign up today and get your 50% welcome bonus on that first deposit. So Aaron, let's get into our first topic today. And that is, of course, the return of Killian Hayes. Uh, very exciting. His presence sort of already gets felt. I know he didn't score in his first game, and that's okay. Um, obviously, they're going to be very ginger with him. Um, they, they, they really uh, have no incentive to give him heavy minutes right now. Um, but in the win against, boy, that was a crushing win. I was flipping between that and the Spurs Cavs game. 9.7 assists, three rebounds, four steals, two blocks versus a Thunder team that I think my cousin was playing for because everybody was out. Um, they, they, they literally had nobody, not to take anything away from Killian's game, but pretty good game, um, regardless of who you're playing against. Nine points, seven dimes, three rebounds, four steals, two blocks. Um, Aaron, there's a lot to unpack with Killian Hayes, what we expect to see, what we want to see, you know, things to look for. Um, how much should he be playing? How much shouldn't he be playing? You know, what sort of lineups do you want to put out there with him? And we're not going to cover every single possible question regarding that. It's just a lot of variables to take into account, but um, let's start with the you know, most obvious one. And I think that most Pistons fans are going to want to, um, 
maybe hone in on a bit. And that's what do you want to see from Killian Hayes for the rest of the season here? Yeah, I think, you know, the biggest thing with him, at least from the eyes of those watching him currently, is he needs to be aggressive and assertive on the offensive side of the court. He's come out and put together some really nice defensive possessions plays. Uh, the game against the Thunder, he played magnificently on the defensive end, just really creating havoc. Um, does a great job moving, getting in passing lanes, winning one-on-one -on -one possessions. Um, so that was great for him on that side of the ball. Obviously, offensively, the, the, the passing ability that he has is known, and it's very much uh, beneficial to the Pistons. We see the effect that it has on them. But outside of that, there's a need to see him get aggressive when it comes to scoring and shooting the basketball. That Thunder game, zero points in the first half, comes on the second half, gets nine points, plays better, knocks down a three-pointer, gets to the cup a little bit. This is something that people are going to be begging for Killian Hayes to do because it was kind of what we saw from him in those first seven games of the year before he went down. He just wasn't very aggressive trying to score the basketball and getting good looks. His shot attempts were wacky, out of place, ill-time, you know, tough shots. He needs to focus on – being assertive and getting good looks, which means coming off that pick topside and not immediately just passing the ball, but getting downhill and going at the rim. It's taking those open three point shots rather than trying to make the extra pass. And, you know, we know all of the other tools that Killian Hayes has, but unlocking that scoring aspect of his game will allow the game to come easier to him will allow his game to flow and I think that's just something that's incredibly important. We know already that he's going to come in and immediately compete on the defensive end. His passing is going to open up the offense for Detroit. But to open up his game specifically, he is going to have to be aggressive, assertive, and confident when it comes to scoring the basketball. Yes, and – and, and, and those are things like being aggressive and scoring the basketball. You know, I, I know he said in an interview after his first game that, you know, he was really feeling fine. Um, wasn't worried about the hip, was playing pretty normal, was playing, you know, free, free flowing. I, I, I do believe that because, you know, he said it. I have, I have no reason to not believe Killian Hayes. There's got to be something in the back of your mind that, you know, thinks about when you make a cut, you know, when you set a pick or whatever, there's, and this is for anybody, there's got to be something in the back of your mind. It's like, oh man, I hope I don't. I hope something doesn't pop, something doesn't sting, twist, whatever you have it. So, you know, to see him and and to have him say that he's feeling okay, um, and that he's playing freely, that's that's a that that's that's really um, that's really good to hear. It was a very lengthy process of coming back and just to, just to see him back out there is good. I agree. I want to see him be aggressive. I touched on the lineup stuff because Laz Jackson had, had, had mentioned, you know, the ideal lineup, which involved Killian and involved Sadiq Bay and Isaiah Stewart and Jerry, or, and, and uh, I almost said Jerry and Grant and Jeremy Grant. Um, out there and you know you're starting to get into the oh maybe this is what they're going to look like in two years when they're hopefully making the playoffs so um, I'm just excited to see him out there and I don't care that he was playing against Teo Maladon I don't care that he was playing against um, uh, <laughs> Svi Mikhailuk I, I don't care he's playing against Kenrick Williams don't know you know it is what it is they had three different guys I think on 10 ways playing yeah significant minutes so yeah yeah it, really he was playing against you know the bottom of the barrel of the league it is what it is right you play the team that's in front of you I mean that's that's just how that's just how it goes um but I thought he looked good and I mean really it's, it's just good we had mentioned a couple of weeks ago it's just good to have him out there and, and, and have something to look forward to and that, that would be the thing to look for. <laughs> it's, it's not to see Jeremy Grant hoist up the most shots on the team. You know, we know that he is, he is this improved player, maybe the most improved player. Um, 
but it's the growth of the young guys. And that's, that starts with killing Hayes. You want to see him out there, you know, doing, doing what, what we know that he can do and showcase those skills. So um, what about, what about uh, uh, lineups and minutes with him? You know, he came off the bench, Saban Lee started at the point. Would you feel comfortable, you know, with him just having the leash, you know, basically thrown away, you know, if he feels comfortable doing it, do you feel, would you feel better if there's a more elongated minutes restriction? And then what sort of lineups do you think would run best with him? Is it, to, is it just to bring him off the bench for now and maybe run that for the rest of the season until, you know, until there's something that prompts him to be moved back in the starting lineup? What, what, what sort of, what sort of things do you want to see Dwayne Casey do on his end to not only maximize the recovery, but also, you know, um, not, not have him lose his confidence, uh, you know, entirely by, by having his minutes kept really firm. Yeah. I like him coming off the bench right now. I think it's allowing him to kind of take the, that first six or so minutes of the game, watch it, you know, learn from it, kind of get himself in game mode. And it just makes it easier for him to come out to the, onto the court. You know, he's coming off a multiple month, you know, injury where he wasn't playing, easing him back into the flow in that way, I think is a good idea. He played 25 minutes against the Thunder. I, I think he needs to be playing at least 25 minutes a night still, whether he's starting or coming off the bench. Um, it, it, you're at a point right now in the season where it, it, Killian Hayes needs to get as many minutes as possible, as many reps as possible, because it, it's essentially a lost season for him considering how much time he did lose to the injury. So he's got to try to salvage as much of it as he can. And let's face it, outside of Saban Lee, uh, you know, there's there's all the opportunity in the world. Corey Joseph should not be a fixture of the rotation for Detroit. Frank Jackson, you know, he mainly plays a two, the two guard spot right now, but Detroit is also playing a lot of two point guard lineups. You know, we've seen Killian and Corey Joseph spend a lot of time together on the court. We see Saban and Corey Joseph on the court together. If you want to consider Frank Jackson a point guard, you see Frank Jackson and Killian or Frank Jackson and Corey Joseph. You still have Dennis Smith Jr. in the mix as well, but there's all the opportunity in the world for Killian to get out there and play, and the Pistons need to capitalize on that. They need to get him in different lineups with guys that are going to be here you know, potentially long-term. I do really like the pairing of Killian and Diallo. That was something that I talked about prior to Killian's return as a pairing that I'm excited to see play together. Now, I think, you know, a lineup that I, I is, it, it got, we got a preview of it in the, in the Thunder game, but it, the optimal lineup looks like it's Killian and Diallo in the backcourt with Sadiq and Jeremy and Isaiah Stewart up front. And, you know, I know that that lineup, it brings together probably the three most promising rookies on Detroit's roster, their best player, and Diallo, a guy that, brings a lot of energy, a lot of toughness, a lot of emotion. You know, maybe that two guard spot goes to someone else like Josh Jackson, but your four guys need to be Killian, Stewart, Bay, and Grant. And, uh, you know, that is a potential lineup of the, not long-term future. That's not the Pistons starting lineup of the future. Uh, if they're going to be competing, like there's going to be another, at least another first round pick in there. You know, maybe there's a free agent or, or something like that also in that mix as well. But, you know, those are guys that at least and for the foreseeable future are part of your core. I think it's it's would be intriguing to see some lineups with maybe Killian and Saban sharing the court together. Um, I think getting Killian and Sekou on the court together is is something that is worth looking at. Those two uh, had some good performances against the Thunder. I know Killian had a couple nice assists to Seku as well. So, you know, maybe that's something that helps revitalize Seku Dumboya is getting to play with Killian Hayes because there's no question about it that Dumboya has struggled this year. And, you know, there is a lot of, re you know, there's a lot of reason to worry about his long-term outlook with the way that he's played. So hopefully that development alongside say Kumboya is something or excuse me alongside killing Hayes is something that could help them boya so I mean there are an endless amount of combinations and lineups that you can run with Killian Hayes but getting him involved with as many young guys on this roster as possible is the easiest path to building chemistry and success for the Pistons 
Yeah, you didn't mention Seku in that, you know, that core moving forward. And I, th I think that speaks volumes. You know, he's he's been usurped by some of the other rookies. And that's, you know, that's that's really important. Um, moving forward is to, you know, rehabilitate his confidence and his standing within the organization. I, that's that's clearly very important. I think that Killian Hayes does make him better for sure. Um, are you concerned about his scoring? I, I'm a little bit concerned. I mean, I don't want to make it a bigger deal than than what it is. I mean, the first eight games, Killian did not score the basketball well whatsoever. And that was the first seven games of his career. And then his first game back after missing multiple months with a hip injury. Comes back out in the second game after his return. He didn't set the world on fire by any stretch of the imagination. But he got to the hole a couple times. He made a three-pointer. You could see it. You could see the the foundation is there. It, I, I, it definitely needs fine tuning. It needs improvement. There's, but he's a rookie. It, it, you know, you expect these things, and he does a lot of other things well to the point where, yes, the scoring is a concern, but right now it's not making or breaking his value. Uh, so it definitely needs to get better. I'm probably not as concerned about it as maybe others are because. <laughs> when you do a lot of other things that helps alleviate the stress of always having to be a scorer. So that's just kind of where I'm at on it. Well, you know, to me, there's, there's a couple different kinds of point guards, you know, Killian Hayes had seven assists against the thunder that can't be discounted. You know, a lot of times, especially on a, you know, a team that does not shoot the ball particularly well and really doesn't have any shooters like the Pistons, he still had seven assists. You know, he's making smart passes and smart reads and, when you're a point guard and you're sort of tasked with running the offense, that seems to, that seems to me like a, like a breaking off point between what kind of point guard you're going to be. Are you going to be a Kyrie Irving volume shooter type of point guard? Are you going to be a more reserved, um, you know, pick the defense apart with your passing type of point guard? Not that Kyrie Irving can't do that. He most definitely can do that, but he searches for the, for the ball and then wants to score. That's, you know, that's just his mentality. Um, I'm sure he would call it the Mamba mentality because of his relationship to Kobe Bryant. But, you know, Killian Hayes does not have to light the world on fire scoring-wise the way that Kyrie Irving does. You know, he can still have that great impact. So the people who are worried about his scoring output maybe potentially have a little bit of um, this mindset that point guards have to score a bunch. You know, they have to be Stephen Curry taking the most shots on the team. They have to be Kyrie Irving taking the most shots or Colin Sexton taking the most shots or whatever. It seems like it's every point guard. So, you know, I think it, it's it's going to take time. He did not look good shooting in the first couple of games into his rookie season. I didn't expect him to shoot the ball particularly well coming off of a major hip injury and missing so much time. But getting to the, getting to the cup, that's something that, looks a little better now because I don't know if you remember this because it was so long ago and when, when you know the first seven games or so it seemed like it was not very easy for him to break down the defense and then figure out what to do after that like he'd get into the paint and sort of there wasn't exactly a plan after that whether it was a floater whether it was you know to finish and get to the rim whether it was to kick it out if seems like this time around there is more of an idea and maybe that's just being around the guys or watching film it seems like there's more of an idea when he does get by that initial defender of what to do after that am i wrong no doubt and i think that that's something that came with him just sitting watching and in learning from not being able to be on the court not being able to play but getting to watch other point guards whether it was on the Pistons or against the team that they were playing and seeing what it takes and, and the, the process it is of breaking down a defense, getting downhill, getting to the rim, you know, taking an angle to the basket, those type of things, he was able to benefit from while being out, which is what you have to try to do. You have to try to take the positives from him missing so much time and, you know, losing a large chunk of his rookie season to the fact that he was able to just kind of get that first taste. It didn't go the best, but using that time off to learn as quickly as he could 
seemingly has helped him because he is getting to the basket a little better. Obviously, there's going to be room to grow, but night and day against the Thunder compared to the first seven games of the season, just a good oh, yeah. player. So uh, definitely promising in that regard. And that second pick or first pick or wherever the Pistons pick, you know, that draft pick matters a whole lot too as, you know, as to how he evolves as a player. You know, if you get a guy like Kate Cunningham, for example, now you've got two playmakers out on the floor, one of which, you know, is a pretty good shooter, can create his own shot and has the defensive capabilities to sort of mask it, you know, mask anything that, that um, is a deficiency. If you get a guy like Jalen Suggs, who, you know, <laughs> I, I think his stock is rising because of, you know, the game winner against Gonzaga when in fact the chase town block and the completely insane skip pass in the same, you know, 15 second sequence is even more impressive to me. Basically what I'm, what I'm trying to say is that that pick this year is going to make a big difference as to what sort of is expected of him as well expected of Killian Hayes. Cause it's going to alter the lineup. You mentioned the two guard, we mentioned the two guard for months and that's really the space on the roster that, or rather in the starting lineup that sort of needs to be filled. But if you fill it with a guy who can score at will, then that opens things up for, for Hayes. And that opens, you know, it up for Sadiq Bay, who we'll get to later in the pod with his three point shooting. No. And and opens it up for Jeremy Grant, who, you know, he's, he's the main scorer. He's being asked to do a lot. I mean, imagine how much more efficient he would be when he's not asked to be the guy who has to go get a bucket when, you know, you need a bucket. So, um, Anything else on the return of killing Hayes? This is a big deal. You know, this is this is important for Pistons fans for the rest of the season. It gives you something to look forward to. I mean, it, it truly does. It does, and I think it's important to keep perspective. I think there's going to be people that are going to rush their judgment on Hayes, and it happens with every rookie, whether it's good or bad, because just like we see people calling Killian Hayes a bust, they're overhyping uh you know, an Anthony Edwards game or, or whoever, you know, for, for whoever it is. So, you know, it's just take the last 20 games of the season in stride and it's not the end all be all each and every single game. It's a process that, you know, we have seen with this young team. It doesn't all happen at once. You know, Sadiq Bay started off the year really strong. He's hit a significant rookie wall. Saban Lee started off the year really strong. He's, you know, cooled down a little bit. He's still playing well, but it it doesn't just click all at once. Everyone doesn't play incredibly well for, you know, a full season at a time. Everyone's going to have their rough stretches. I mean, Jeremy Grant has had his rough stretches. His shooting has taken a toll. So it happens with every player. You have to watch the development process and just not rush to make judgments. Yes, you definitely need some time, and before any of these guys turn into stars, you, you know, they're gonna have, you know, um, they're gonna have some growing pains. That, that, that's just how it goes, especially at, at point guard. I think I've said it every, every other week on the pod that point guard, it's just a hard position to learn. So, you know, to see a guy like Hayes have nine points, seven assists, three rebounds, four steals too. That's important, and then two blocks, all against Thunder. That's that to me is filling the stat sheet. So. It's that's that's very encouraging. I mean, you want you want him to turn into a star, and you know you want him to be the biggest and the bright star, much like the sun, right, Aaron? <laughs> that sun can really, <laughs> that sun can can really much much like the sun. Yes, it can blind you even. It can blind you if you're not well equipped with a good pair of sunglasses. And it's time to talk about our next sponsor, um, which does. Just that, that is Canaan. Um, it's time to make your outdoor experiences better with Canaan. Canaan sunglasses are made exclusively with polarized lenses for optimal clarity. They're made with Japanese optics, um, clearer, lighter, and stronger, and Italian handcrafted frames that are impossible to scratch. Italian handcrafted frames, I'm Italian, so certified and approved. Use the exclusive code Canaan cast 15 at Canaan.com to receive 15% off on your first pair. That's Canaan cast 15. I'll spell it for you. K A E N O N C A S T 
1-5. That is CanaanCast15 at Canaan.com to receive 15% off on your first pair of glasses. Again, you need to have a good pair of sunglasses. We're getting towards summer. It's going to be sunny. I mean, even in Cleveland and Northeast Ohio and Detroit, it's still going to be sunny. It's just the other, you know, seven months doesn't really know what it's going to be. But either way, you need a good pair of sunglasses. Use that exclusive exclusive code CanaanCast15. Again, that's K-A-E-N-O-N-C-A-S-T-1-5 at Canaan.com. Canaan, clearly better. Um, Aaron, I have regular glasses. That's what I wear. I wish I had contacts. Um, but wearing sunglasses is very difficult for me as a glasses wearer. I really need to get contacts back really, really badly. Yeah, I um, I was just I lost my pair of sunglasses pretty recently, and it's definitely come back to bite me a few times. So this this uh, code probably Do could. I have a code for you, my friend. Yeah, probably could not have come at a better time. Let's just put it that way. <laughs> it's just the concept of having to put, like, I'm not going to put on those snap-ons. I am 26. I'm not at the age where I need to put on snap-ons on my regular glasses to give myself sunglasses. I'm not quite there yet. I need to give it a, a couple years. A couple more years, maybe. A couple. A, a couple decades, perhaps. So if I, if and when I get contacts back, I, I will be in need for a pair of sunglasses, majorly. So good timing. Um, with our ad Canaan. Topic number two. Now, I can't believe we're talking about Tyler Cook still. I really thought that that was going to be it, a one and done 10-day contract, but uh, not the case. He's getting a pretty pretty elongated look. I'm going to pull up his minutes here. Um, he had 23 minutes today. That's on par with Hamdou Diallo and Sekou Dumboya. What do we make of Tyler Cook? Is this a guy who's going to stick? Is he pretty much what I pegged him for when he signed, which is an, essentially an innings eater, which is, hey, we don't want to use up and bang up our guys. Let's grab this guy and just have him play a whole bunch of minutes and absorb some contact, and then we'll let him loose. Um, 23 minutes is not an insignificant amount of minutes. i tell you what, he's making a case. He is making a case. He plays hard. Not the tallest guy out there, but he uses his body. He's very athletic. Not the most skilled offensive player, but he just goes out there and hustles kind of in the same ilk of Isaiah Stewart. And, you know, I think there's there's definitely a spot in this league for a guy like Tyler Cook. I don't know if it's with the Pistons, but he has come out and – you know, even against the Thunder, 24 minutes for him, nine points, three rebounds, two assists. He's not going to blow you away. He's not a guy that's going to get 15 and 10 or whatever. But off the bench, he can give you 15 minutes a night of hard-nosed basketball. He's going to get down low, make some plays. I think he's gotten a deserved look. He's done well in that look. And I think he's proven that he deserves a legitimate chance in this league. Well, he's had 23 minutes against the Thunder, as you said. He had five minutes against the Knicks. He had 23 minutes again against the Wizards in that super blowout, which probably impacted his minutes load there as well. Uh, and then against the Portland Trailblazers, he had 15 minutes. So, and there's been a series of injuries, you know, that probably prompted that. Sigrid Dumboya missed a couple of games. Joel so Okafor has remained out. But, you know, when he signed and was getting minutes over Sekou, we sort of thought, oh, for the love of God, he's going to get minutes over Dumboya. You know, a guy on, on a 10-day get more minutes over your first round pick a year ago. Now, who does he affect the most? Who does Tyler Cook affect the most with, with this sudden surge of minutes? And you're right, he does play hard. He, he is a guy to get behind, you know, bounced around the league, bounced around some teams, and then just all of a sudden sticks one place and, you know, Plays okay. Well, that's exactly who he affects is Sekou Dumboya. Uh, even when Dumboya came back and was listed as active, Cook was getting minutes over him. He was getting the opportunity. And, and when you look at where the Pistons are at, they're going to get Mason Plumley back here soon, you would imagine. And 
you know, you have Mason Plumley and Isaiah Stewart at the four, at the five spot. That's where Tyler Cook was playing against the Thunder. Well, that bumps him down to the four spot. You have Jeremy Grant at the four spot, and then it's kind of a battle between him and Saquon Dumboya. Now, in Dumboya's defense, Dumboya had a good game against the Thunder, and you know, a lot of the Pistons had a good game against the Thunder. So it's something that we'll have to see if that can legitimately carry on. Uh, he really did look good. He did. So it was, it was very nice. Yes. So we have to see if it's something that's going to carry on past playing really a team of G leaguers and rookies. And is it going to translate to some games against some tougher competition? And it it's look, if you're, you, you would have to hope that say Kunumboya can outperform Tyler Cook considering one is a fringe lottery pick and the other is coming from the G league, but it is a legitimate battle right now. And, Cook stands to really put Dumboya in a bad spot if he can if he continues to outperform him. You know, there's been like some lukewarm talk about Seku just kind of not having that that inner drive or passion. Basically, a fire needed to be lit underneath him. And Dwayne Casey's very you're gonna earn your minutes type of guy. You're gonna earn your minutes in practice and then you're gonna get in the game. He's very much oriented like that. And some rookies sort of don't take well to that, Um, whether it's not what they had to do in overseas and they were just kind of handed minutes or they're college kids who were the dominant force on their team. And they, you know, they never had to worry about getting minutes in practice because they were always going to play. And you get to the NBA and, you know, that's not really the case. You got a bunch of guys who are really hungry together. Do you think it's possible, big brain, conspiracy theory here do you think it's possible tyler cook was signed simply because they knew what they were getting in him as a high energy guy they just wanted to put somebody behind seku and sort of essentially push him hey if that was the idea the whole time it's genius because it seems to have worked i mean seku came out and really played like there was a a fire under him that he needed to perform and I don't know if that is the case with him. You know, it wasn't something that you heard about pre-draft. You know, that didn't come out in any of the scouting reports or any of the post-draft chatter. There wasn't that talk. But, you know, maybe just due to how this his career has started, he kind of lost his footing and lost his drive a little bit. And, you know, maybe the Tyler Cook signing and the Tyler Cook performances have, you know, made him turn it up a little bit and, and get back into where he needs to be and where, you know, he has the talent to be. So now that's a fair point. And, and I guess that's, that's something that you, you know, you have to think about and you know, we'll see if it's, if, if, if Dubois can continue to improve and perform when given the opportunity, because as long as Tyler cooks here, there's a competition for his minutes. He got uh, – how many minutes did Seku get today? Seku against the Thunder. He had, he had 23 minutes. Yeah. He had, so he had 23 minutes against the Thunder. Against the Knicks, he was a DMP CD coach's decision. He didn't play, which the Pistons were absolutely massacred. So not exactly missing much. And Tyler Cook only had five minutes. So not that we're turning this into a battle of who gets more minutes, Tyler Cook or Seku. But, you know, that's, that's where we're sort of at um, against the Wizards. Um, Seku is once again a DMP CD, a coach's a coach's decision. Cook had 23 more minutes. So, you know, another thing to just sort of look forward to as you finish out the season um, is how this sort of shakes out. I mean, you really do hope that going from basically a DMP for your coach's decision to two games in a row, and then you get 23 minutes here. And look pretty good. I mean, that has to bode well moving forward. But yeah, he does affect Seku a lot, and that's kind of interesting, I guess. <laughs> I mean, everybody else on the team is battling and busting their butts, and you know, you want Seku to do that same thing. So um, maybe, maybe Tyler Cook was just there to light the fire, um, and we'll see if it works. Um, speaking of the young core for the Pistons. We had mentioned earlier about Sadiq Bay and he hit a little bit of a rookie wall, which a lot of rookies do. It's not, it's not anything to be super concerned about, but 
he's set the all-time record for most three-pointers as a Pistons rookie. Um, I'm going to try to find the person he passed because I was ill-prepared for this podcast. But um, what do you think about Sadiq Bey um, turning into the sniper? Yeah, rookie wall aside, Sadiq Bey has really just over exceeded the expectations that were set for him coming into his rookie season came in um, very quickly won a rotation spot very quickly won a starting spot and he has come out and I get as of late he's hit that rookie wall but his shooting his defense his toughness that is a player that really looks like he's going to have a future for Detroit. That's why he's being slotted in as the Pistons small forward of the future right now. He does so many things very, very well. Uh, he has gotten better at putting the ball on the floor. He likes that back to the basket game a little bit, turning, turn on jumpers, things like that. He's a very tough defender. He's a good rebounder. So that shooting probably stands out the most obviously he's setting records for how many threes he's knocking down right now which is great but he does a lot of things well and he's really really setting himself up to be an important part of the Pistons core moving forward coming out of the draft there was obviously the talk of Killian Hayes and how he is you know a huge aspect to Detroit's future and then I think you looked at Bay and Stewart and like well you know I guess we'll see the Pistons you know took them and they traded to have that opportunity to draft Isaiah Stewart and traded to have that opportunity, uh, you know, to get Sadiq Bay. So, you know, they've invested in them. And right now the returns are looking very, very good. Bay really does appear to have a lot of potential. He brings a lot to the table for Detroit. And that's a guy that hopefully sooner rather than later can break out of that rookie wall and end the season on a hot note with, the rest of those young Pistons that are playing, you know, trying to play hard and, and get better right now. So Pistons rookies, most three point makes in a season. So he just hit or just passed um, with 106 three point field goals made. Do you already know who, who has the most three point field goals by a Pistons rookie in a season? Was it Brandon Knight? It. <laughs> It was Brandon Knight. That is an excellent, um, excellent, uh, excellent work, my friend. Do you know? <laughs> do you know who he um, uh, passed after that? So, Sekou's, or I'm sorry, Sadiq's first, 2011, 2012. That is absurd, by the way. That is nuts. Do you know who's third? Um. All right, I'm going to take a shot in the dark here. Kyle Singler. Okay. I am impressed. It is not Kyle Singler. He's fourth. He had 73-point makes in 82 games in 2012-2013. Okay. This uh, person had the – it was <laughs> – boy, you're going to be upset. Can I get a hint? Um, gosh, let's see. I don't really know if I can make a hint. I mean, it's definitely in your realm of knowledge. Uh, it, it, it's it's not some dude from the 70s or from the 80s. Oh, man. <sighs> this person hit 81 three-pointers. I'm not going to get it. You you are. <laughs> I'm gonna you got get... Kyle Singler. You got Kyle Singler. I, I was about to Venmo you $5 if you got Kyle Singler. <laughs> and I'm glad I didn't say that because you, you drilled that one. I, he played all 82 games that season. That's impressive. It is Luke Kennard. <laughs> oh, wow. Okay, I was just about to say Contavious Caldwell Pope, but if I remember, uh, <laughs> I don't look, I think he like got benched for a significant portion of his rookie year. So Luke Kennard, yeah, 82 games, and then he failed to play 82 games ever again. Um, that was a one hit wonder. Kyle Singler had 82 games. Oh. Kyle Singler played 82 games. That's even more bizarre. Yeah. Luke Kennard, wow. Probably should have got that one in hindsight. I told you that's how I was Well, gonna... quick, uh, you know, short-term memory loss there. I mean, you know, he, yeah, he signs, he gets a huge contract. I 
got traded for. Like Sadiq Bay replaced. That is a good point. So, you know, 73 games as a rookie for Luke Kennard. Still pretty good for a rookie. He had 81 threes. Sadiq Bay in 41 games had 91 three pointers made. That is that's that's, that's impressive. Good. That is very good. That's a very good sign. Um, so and Brandon Knight had 105 in you know in, in 66 games, and Sadiq Bay definitely definitely beat beat that out too. So I mean that is that is good stuff. 47 games, 48 games. So yeah, it's got to be something like that. Yeah. 48 games. Yeah. That's, I mean that's pretty good. That's obviously it's pretty good. That's very good. Oh 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 yes. Most definitely. Most definitely. So um, he has hit a bit of rookie wall, which is fine. Do you think there's something that he's super – like is there some way that I guess out of, the, out of the core skills that you're looking for, he's got shooting pretty much handled. He's a tenacious rebounder. Is there something that – he could improve upon that would, you know, make, make him a little bit more flexible for Pistons lineups move forward. Like, yeah, most definitely. I mean, the shot creation for him is, is the next step, putting the ball on the floor, creating his own opportunities off the dribble in the mid range, things of, of that nature. He's obviously a marksman spotting up and he does have a little bit of a back to the basket game, but we have not really seen him do that all too often as of late. That certainly seemed like it was something we saw, more in a more prevalent stage earlier on in his rookie season but you know being more capable more aggressive of getting to the basket finishing operating in the mid-range and you know and that that goes shot creation goes outside of just himself but being able to create for others as well is important obviously Detroit's trying to play as many ball handlers as, as possible and as Sadiq Bay can show, hey, I can handle the ball, I can move the ball too, then it eliminates the need for maybe someone like Corey Joseph to be playing 20 to 25 minutes a night, which is an atrocity in itself. Um, <laughs> but it, that is the flexibility that could be provided in a situation like that. And not to beat a dead horse, but much like Killian Hayes and his future, you know, what you want out of him. That second pick, I keep saying the second pick, that pick in the draft coming up, dictate so much you know the Pistons have this good core four they're missing that you know that fifth guy and this is the draft where you could get that guy and start to really you know map out how you want the team to operate because if you do get a secondary ball handler who can play next to Killian Hayes that means that Sadiq Bay does not have to worry about doing that it's great if you can Right. I mean, I mean, I mean, that's that's like a best case is, you know, he does develop that skill anyway. Um, that's why if you're, tra- if you- you're praying that you get a top three pick because it's going right. to be a shot at Cade or, or Jalen Suggs. And really, I guess that means you probably need a top two pick between Cade and Jalen Suggs. But, you know, outside of that, yeah, some probably. other cards you could take if you don't go with Evan Mobley. Uh, I, but you you definitely are if you're Troy Weaver you're praying that you get a number two pick but it just doesn't look like it with the way that the Pistons are you know finding ways to steal steal win yeah you know their schedule certainly has gotten a little bit easier compared to the beginning of the season that first part of their schedule which was one of the harder if not the harder schedules in in the league but yeah a little bit easier and playing those tougher teams at the beginning certainly helped. Detroit now in terms of being more competitive. So, you know, it is important that the Pistons try to find that complementary piece to fit into that lineup in the draft. And, you know, it, with the way it's going, they might end up missing out on Cunningham or Jalen Suggs just because they're starting to win more ball games. Uh, well, that's the beauty, right, of the adjusted lottery odds is that the three worst teams have the same lottery odds. And, you know, you never know. You never know how those things, you know, how those dominoes will fall. But we will have to see. The lottery is getting ever closer. Uh, and I can't wait for the lottery. I like having two – I like being invested in two teams so high up because I'm – you know, it just increases my odds to have one of these – one of my one of my two teams between Detroit and Cleveland 
getting that top pick. And it will just make it even more disappointing somehow when neither of those teams get the top pick and both fall out of the top three. That's just going to be, I'm really looking forward to being disappointed live. You know, if we do a live stream. Well, if you remember last year when the Pistons got, you know, seven, it was, it was, the reaction was everyone was just kind of right at the same time. (laughs) Uh, Of course, but. Yeah, right now the Pistons with the third worst record in the league behind Minnesota and Houston, but Orlando, Washington, and Mike's Cavs are, yeah. are knocking on the doorstep of Detroit. So Detroit needs to well, lose. Cavs won and blew it. Cav, you know, they they beat the Spurs by a significant amount. And I think Washington found a way to lose, so that helps them out. The Magic, you know, we, we like the Magic because they were – you know, they beat the Clippers, and then I think they lost by, like, 2 million against the Utah Jazz. It was, like, a 50-point game, and I looked at them like, oh, my gracious. Right after, uh, the you know, the Raptors won by 50. It was like, that was a really weird, like, 48 hours. Like, two, two teams getting absolutely annihilated. Um, so, yeah, or, Orlando's going to fade quickly, fading for Cade, right? Um, but it's it's that other pick, and, you know, the Cavs fall, fall in that in – the, in that category two, you know, this pick is so important because a guy like Suggs or Kate can just unlock so much on both those teams. He can unlock so much for the Pistons being that secondary ball handler and just initiate offense and allow Hayes to play off ball. And, you know, Kate could play off ball with Hayes handling it. There's just so many different possibilities that would make the Pistons so much more dimensional offensively that, you know, it's 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 just tantalizing. So, Sadiq Bay, good three point shooter, good. He's gonna fall into that category. You know, if the Pistons get Cade or Jalen, so like he he's he's gonna fall into that. Clay Thompson, you know, how many dribbles did he take and how many points did he get? Because it's gonna be like, like what, like six dribbles or something stupid um, that Clay Thompson had because literally his entire job was to you know get the ball, maybe just a pump fake dribble, steps to the left and drills it. Um, I, I could see Sadiq Bay if the Pistons get that sort of pick with another ball handler being that kind of guy where he's just just going to knock him down and he does not have to move that much. He doesn't have to I like the way. have to create. Uh, yeah, yeah, that's a great comp, huh? Wonderful, Clay Thompson, <laughs> one of my favorite players. I think that's the perfect way to end the podcast is Mike calling Sadiq Bay Clay Thompson. So that's that's this week's Mitch McGarry. <laughs> Uh, this one's a lot better. This one's a lot better. Two Mitch McGarry uh, references. We are good for the next like five years. Yep. At least next five years. So uh, Aaron already prompted it. Um, that's going to do it for this edition of the Palace of Pistons podcast. Thank you very much for listening. Once again, um, quick shout out to our sponsors again, Bet Online and Canaan. Uh, excellent sponsors. We look forward to working with them in the future. Um, And again, thank you for listening to the Palace Pistons podcast. We will be back uh, next week again to talk about all of the uh, wonderful Pistons news and hopefully some more Killian Hayes uh, buckets. We will see you next time, folks.